Hey, hockey fans, welcome to the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. You know, I've spent over four decades working in the game, fortunate enough to meet some of the legends of the game, saw them come into the league, watch them shine in the game, and now they've moved on to life after the game. The 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast gives us a chance to catch up, tell some great stories, and li- relive some great memories and hear what they're up to today. Today's legend is one of the greatest Toronto Maple Leaf legends of all time. He captained the Leafs to back-to-back conference finals, a world junior gold medalist, Wendell Clark. Wendell, welcome, buddy. Great to catch up with you again. Oh, good to see you. Good to see you. Usually it's on a golf course somewhere. I, it is it? true. <laughs> it is true. I think the last time you and I got together, we were playing golf with uh, our hockey insider, Pierre Lebrun, up in Muskoka at, at uh, Rocky Crest. How's your game? Uh, well, it's uh, going to be bad whenever the snow leaves because <laughs> I, I start out really bad, and then by the time we put the clubs away in October, I'm okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, listen, it's I, I love hanging out with you and watching people's reactions when they see you, especially in the Toronto market, because, I mean, you are one of the great legends of all time uh, in the blue and white, had your number raised to the rafters, so much success with this organization, things you've done. Can you believe that a kid from Kelvington, Saskatchewan, population, what was the population, about 17 and 16 when you left? Yeah. Like yeah. that you've accomplished so much and come so far over just the last couple of decades. Uh, no, it's a, you never know when you're leaving a small town, uh, like most players, when they leave their hometown, they don't really think hockey seems too far away, too good to make it yeah. when you're watching, when you're a kid watching those NHLers play and uh, to get there and be a part of it. And uh, just also, I played for a great organization as in the Leafs that the fans are, you're still you're you're still a something this many years after you're done playing just because of how great the fans are uh, following our team. You know what I found really interesting is is the fact that listen we've had Marty Brodeur on the, on the show earlier and you know he wasn't always going to be a goalie. He talked about the fact that he was actually ten or eleven before he actually decided to play in that. So it's not unusual to see guys change positions. Your situation though was a little bit more unusual because you didn't change positions at ten. You, you, why don't you tell our audience you 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 were coming into the NHL as a defenseman, and then found out you were going to play up front. Tell us how that happened and how you found out about it. Yeah, no, well, I uh, well, I played the first time defense really uh, World Juniors training camp uh, in Belleville. I actually thought I was getting cut, and I got called in and said, "If you want to make the team, can you play some defense and some forward? We wanted to take extra defense to." to Europe for Finland where the world tournament was in case somebody gets hurt. So that's when I started. I played, I think in the world juniors, I played three games forward and three games defense in the tournament. Um, And then I, you know, did my interviews for the draft interviews, all the teams. And had I been drafted to to Pittsburgh, New Jersey, Islanders, Vancouver, I would have been a defenseman. Um, Toronto, they didn't tip their hand either way till I got to training camp. And in training camp, you you know, you walk in, there's 60 people coming to camp and you look at which door you're going in and it <laughs> said Wendell Clark and it's you know, Wendell Clark, Gary Lehman, Russ Courtnell. So I guess I'm a left winger. I'm not paired with Benning or Nyland or anything. I'm, <laughs> I'm on the three, uh, the, the three across. You would never get away with something like that nowadays. There's no way you could draft a, guy, a kid as a defenseman and say to him, oh, by the way, you're going to be playing up front. What was that like for you when you saw that and realized how they wanted to use you? Um, I, I think it just would. However, uh, you know, I'm so excited that you have a chance that yeah. you're going to play at the highest level. Um, I think probably because I played three games at forward in world juniors, that that help to say okay yeah. you're you know scored uh, the last goal i guess playing forward in the world junior tournament so that that maybe helped it mentally a bit because you know you've played it uh where had it happened i hadn't played any forward at all and i go yeah. to my first training camp and you're forward maybe that would have been a little different what was it like so now you're going to the draft and the 1985 draft and you, you the Leafs have got first pick overall i'm sure you'd had some conversations with them and had some indication that that's where you were going to go but then all of a sudden it's happening and and you are a toronto maple leaf what was that like to find out you were going first overall into the leafs uh, well i didn't know for sure until it was actually announced uh mm-hmm. harold and the staff didn't tip their hand, Jerry McNamara, anybody in the staff didn't tip their hand in any way that I was going to be taken first. Um, you kind of had an idea. You're, I knew I was going top three. <laughs> That's where it kind of narrowed down to. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, but not not a definite definite. They wouldn't tip their hand. And then uh, getting drafted to Toronto was a huge honor. And uh, I, I had the least nerves, I guess. I had to wait the shortest amount of time. But yeah. being that the draft, that'd be the first time the draft had left Montreal and it was in Toronto at the convention center downtown. So it was great to be a, a hometown first pick. You mentioned, Harold, we should, for, for the younger audience, maybe doesn't know this. By the way, we're in conversation with one of the greatest lead, Leaf legends of all time, Wendell Clark. This is the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. You mentioned, Harold, you're obviously talking about the, I'm trying to think of an adjective to describe him, <laughs> the, the owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs during your time. I, I think I've heard crotchety, uh, grumpy, uh, little tight financially to describe Harold Ballard. Give it. Tell us what your initial experiences were, because you had actually a pretty funny experience with Harold Ballard at the draft itself, right? Tell us about your relationship with him. Well, no, Harold was uh, like, as far as across the players, he was always pretty good in my era, my time. Yeah. I think Daryl probably has a little different story in his yeah, no kidding. timing, but I, you know, from my time, um, he was always crotchety and, and, uh, that was, he was probably the first guy that uh, figured out that good media or bad media is all media. So, mm -hmm. cause, cause he was more crotchety to the media than anybody, like he wanted to dictate it. Um, and, but he treated us or treated myself and family very well, re realistically. And I know he's tight, very tight with the, the money and negotiations and agents he hated and, but, um, he, he was a personality in himself. I think he bought the Hamilton Tiger Cats just to rub it in the Argos fans. Yep. So he could have a banner in the gardens, uh, a tie cat banner in Toronto type thing. So he did all that kind of stuff. And he just, he, that's what made it fun for him. I think And the older he got, the, the it got worse because everybody that was close to him had passed away, whether it be right. King Clancy or his wife or all those Yolanda. close friends that kind of yeah. helped keep him in check were gone. And, and and so there was nothing to keep him in check. Uh, he was a bit erratic at times. You tell a great story of uh, chocolate and charters. Oh, what, <laughs> why don't you tell us that story? Yeah, no, one of my first flights, I get first, I think we got uh, canceled off that plane when he found out that I think King Clancy walked on or one of the older guys that knew him back my had to be my first year and said, don't give this old guy coming on any chocolate. He's a diabetic. Well, <laughs> The, the the ladies and on the plane they had no idea he was the owner so they wouldn't give him any chocolate so that was it canceled the plane from there on in on that <laughs> that service just because he couldn't get, get chocolate and because of his diabetes on all, all our plane flights coming home after games we were pretty much sitting in underwear all the time because he was be cold so he's got the heat cranked on all the planes coming home <laughs> just to, to be warm because of the situation he's in yeah, he was quite the character, and and you had an opportunity to to play on the ice in the old Maple Leaf Gardens when you got to see Harold at the end of the ice in his old bunker. For uh, veteran hockey fans, you'll remember the old bunker that Harold had there and had an apartment in the in the building. So now you break into the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, you got great scoring touch, but you're also a fighter. Your numbers in your rookie season, I think you had like over two hundred and almost two hundred and thirty penalty minutes in your rookie season, and you also had 34 goals in that year. And did, did you have any sense of the way you were going to be received by this Toronto market? Because going first overall is going to be really tough because expectations are huge. And you come in and deliver with the goals, but then you also deliver with the penalty minutes. Did you feel like you stepped into instant celebrity when you stepped into the market and, and exploded onto the scene the way you did? Um, it it kind of... It, it, because that I was a very aggressive defenseman and liked to do it. Obviously, that's why I was doing it. Yeah. Um. And, and so basically, the players like Big Daddy Bob McGill. My first two fights were training camp with Big Daddy. It's like Big Daddy, I went first overall. I'm not here to take your job. But <laughs> that that was his reading the penalty minutes. You know, trying to make sure I'm uh, who I am type thing. And then my first two fights in the NHL. So this is all training camp first overall, and I fight the the, the team tough guy. And then my first game in Edmonton, I. Uh, my first two games against Edmonton, I fight McSharley twice. Uh, they're a tough guy. And, and so, but as a forward, because of how I played as a defenseman and physical, but as a forward, you're initiating a lot more. So if you play as a physical forward, you're initiating a lot of stuff all the time on the dump and chase and chasing somebody yeah. down, finishing your check. So it creates anxiety of people wanting to do something back or stand up for what you did. 
And, and so that, that started, uh, the fighting was part of it. And I probably didn't have to do as much of it, but um, if you're going to play physical in that era, somebody was going to answer to you. So you either stop playing so physical or play physical and just answer the bell. Uh, playing physical, and, and I didn't want to really change. I liked playing physical, so that created a lot of fighting. I think in today's game, you're seeing the, the young defenseman in, in, yeah. on the Rangers there getting in a few fights because he plays plays hard, and they're clean hits, but uh, players are sticking up for their teammates, and that's all part of it. People think today, well, that there's there's a clean hit, and they're sticking up for Well, yeah. I had to stick up for my hits. You know, if I hit Mark Howe, I know Rick Tockett's coming, or Dave Brown if I hit. I just know, and if you back in those days, there was no instigating, there was no so that tough guy. If you didn't want to fight, he could just fight you anyway. And the ref would say, "You started it. You made you you threw the first body check." But Wendell, you were a goal scorer. I remember. I remember. I was a young reporter in your early days in in playing the game, and I remember looking at your hands while I've interviewing you. And I hope this is not too weird for you, but your hands were like all swollen and your knuckles were destroyed. And I'm thinking this is a guy that can score 30 a season and he's destroying his hands in fights. Did that, did that ever phase you or were you given the extra space to score because you use those mitts to fight as uh, well? It, it's a bit of both. That's uh, you know, the, the, the Rick Tockets, Cam Neely's uh, you know, Bob Probert's probably your biggest toughest guy that scored 30 because it gives you room. Um, you always yeah. tell players that aren't quite as skilled in order to get, uh, make people give you some time a pow- That's what a power forward is. Uh, you know, that's, he, he gets a little time because the player he's playing against doesn't know how he's going to react in the corner. So then they give him some space. So if you get a little space, you get to be a little better because you get time. Wayne Gretzky and Mario got to do it because you you knew how good they were. <laughs> you'd back off. So they didn't make you look bad. Yeah. But as soon as you back off a player that's that skilled, they make you look even worse. But so, they also had some protectors, though, too. They, no, they did. They, they they had some guys that skate around later and make sure that. Uh, but it was actually safer. It was probably a safer era for skilled players when I played than it is today. Because today you can hit a skilled player, skate away, and say, I don't have to do anything about it. And, there, yeah. and there's nothing today's player. So you see a lot of side hits and stuff that goes that our good players have to deal with that nobody can do anything. They, they, you can't really, you can get all the tough guys you want. You can't protect your skilled players on the ice today. No, no, you can't. And um, the, the two things that stood out in my mind in watching you play in the early days was your hands because of the fighting, but also your back, man, you were, you were barely in the league. I think you were in your second year in the league where, and I don't even remember the incident. Do you remember who it was who cross-checked you into the, po- into the crossbar? That yeah, started all your back problems. Everybody thinks it was one incident. There was no incident that caused the bad back. It yeah. was more probably because of my physical play and how I yeah. played. And you think of the rehab we did in the old days, it, there was none. So you played yeah. through everything. There was no days off in practice. It's tough being a 19, 18, 19 year old asking John Brophy for a day off. Yeah. So you're, you were, <laughs> there was no days off, and every practice was an hour and a half long. So you, I played through and like every player did of that era. Yeah. That you, but Wendell, don't downplay it, man. You were in the trainer's room for hours and hours and hours. Well, once, every- once I, yeah, once I, I missed a year of hockey, a hundred games in a row, um, because I played through groin injuries, hip injuries, shoulder injuries, uh, broken hands and stuff. You played through all that. You started adapting as a player and sooner or later, my back said, okay, that's it. You've adapted, yeah. you've changed a little. And that's really what happens with my back was that I adapted because you never really stopped playing through all the other injuries. Yeah. That 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 was the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing. And so I missed a year, well, 100 games. And, and then got Chris Broadhurst, who was the guy that was able to keep me together. And I spent two to, two to three hours every day for the next yeah. 12 years, uh, every day doing therapy to be able to play the game. So I... I uh, yeah, the body, uh, the body took its toll, but it wasn't just the NHL. It was probably all the minor hockey and junior hockey because of the style I played. It wasn't any one incident. Yeah. You also did something funny. You tell a funny story about uh, you weren't doing anything to get rid of the pain, and including acupuncture, which came back to haunt you a couple of years later. Do you want to tell that story about the needle? No, I was doing – I did acupuncture or something because they, they got to go deep direct acupuncture into – hips and groins and glutes and stuff. And, and so I had one break off in my, uh, in my groin. And so just about two inches, nothing big. 
Uh-oh. and Wendell, <laughs> and we couldn't we couldn't find it. So about three years later, I get traded to Quebec. So I walk in after a game to the trainer's off to trainer's office, and because I have a thing pointing coming out of trying to get out of my skin, and it's a needle, and I go to the doctor. Can you just cut me open here and pull this thing, the needle that's left in my leg? <laughs> and he's looking at me cross-eyed, going, "You're crazy. There's no way there's a metal object in your body." And I said, "No, there is. If you cut it open, you'll see." And a piece of metal, two inches long, came out of my leg. Just a, they're real fine little needles, but. Uh, yeah, it, it gradually worked its way back out. I guess it's good it didn't go the other way in the bloodstream. No kidding. You're freaking unbelievable. And and honestly, for, for those who didn't get a chance to experience you as a player, that's why people freaking loved you so much, man. It was like, if you could stand, you're out there. You were never complaining. And if they, if, a, if a game called, you guys fell a little bit behind and you needed, needed a goal, you were there. If they needed somebody to kind of fire things up, you were there. And what it ends up being is you end up getting to see from one of the most storied franchises, NHL history, they hand you the captaincy in the 92, 93 season. What was that like when they said, Wendell, we're making you our captain? Uh, Well, it was a huge honor. You watch hockey forever and you get to wear a a letter on your Jersey and especially one of original six Canadian team. And uh, it happened in 91 uh, Canada cup, uh, Cliff Fletcher and Tom Watt. Cliff Fletcher just come in. Tom Watt was still coaching that 91-92 season. And uh, they announced it during the Canada Cup uh, in Maple Leaf Gardens at the Hot Stove yeah. Lounge. And then, so the players, you think of there's Gretzky and Messi, all the Mario, all the big guys. So they thought they'd play a joke and they'd throw a, a C on my jersey during the tra- Canada Cup tryouts type thing. As on my practice jersey, they threw a C on my jersey. That's for awesome. Inner squad games as a joke. Little, little did they know that meant cut. I got cut about a week <laughs> later, so <laughs> C meant cut. But it was, uh, it, it's a huge honor and fun, and just to be a part of it. That they, they, the management and coaching staff think that you're you're able to carry that letter. That's that's awesome. We're in conversation with Wendell Clark, one of the all-time great Toronto Maple Leafs. So this is the Seven Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. So in your second year wearing the C, the ninety two ninety three season. The Leafs set team records in wins with 44 and points with 99. So things are going real well. And you guys made the playoffs for the first time in three years and actually reached the conference final. So we get to the 1993 run, which was unbelievable. Was it all that you had expected and hoped for and more? Uh, Well, there's nothing better than being in the playoffs, especially in Toronto, but I would say Canadian city in general, because just because our climate, all of a sudden it's springtime, it's warm, it's hot. uh, You're playing well. So you're coming to the rink. Everything's different. Everything's warm. It's top down people. It's, it's a fun time to play. And, and it's all, I I always tell people it's the easiest time to play because if you're a player, I always brought it down to game time. You don't have to practice anymore. You play every yeah. four days. So think of it. An average player plays 15 to 18 minutes. Unless you're Doug Gilmore, you play 25 to 30. Yeah. But the, us average guys play 15 to 18 minutes. So in your mind, no matter how bad your body feels, I work 15 to 8 I only work 15 to 18 <laughs> minutes every 48 hours. It's not a bad job. <laughs> when you when you break it down that way, you take out the travel and all the stuff that goes on, but actual yeah. workload is only 15 to 18 minutes every 48 hours. That's awesome. So you're in the 1993. I want to walk you through this. So you're the 1993 playoffs. You get the Red Wings in the opening round. They finished ahead of you in the standings. They were the favorite team. They come back and they win games one and two, and it wasn't close. They thump you guys 6-3 and 6-2. You were always the guy that if things started to go the wrong way, if you were called upon or your teammates looked at you, then no one even needed to say this. They said, Wendell, go out there and spark us. We need your spark to turn us around. But in this particular moment, you were coached by a guy who's one of the all-time legends, a Hockey Hall of Famer, who said, Wendell, you're not going to be regular season Wendell here. You're going to be a different guy in the playoffs. Explain that story and explain the instructions you got from the legend Pat Burns. Yeah, well, we all, you know, once it comes to playoff time, everybody's got their individual meetings and team meetings and everybody, exactly what's going on. And he said, no matter what happens, you are not to fight Bob Probert or any of the tough guys. You will not be doing. So as we are losing those first two games badly, you keep turning around to look at him and he's shaking his head. No, 
Like <laughs> it's all, that must not, have driven you nuts. Yeah, no. So, but remember for those two losses, and then you have two more days off before you play or a day off before you play again. I was getting carved for like two and a half, three, four days because I wasn't trying to change something my usual self. Meanwhile, I couldn't tell you why I wasn't doing it because yeah. the coach had said, no, you're not doing it. And, and so it, it all worked out. We won the next three games by close scores, lost game six badly again, and then we won uh, game seven. And in that game three, in the turnaround game, you had the uh, uh, the power play game winner in game three. So don't make it sound like you didn't have an impact in a turnaround because you certainly did that. So you get by the Red Wings. Uh, you got real scared there. Then you beat the St. Louis Blues. And now you get Wayne Gretzky and the LA Kings in the conference final. What was the buzz around the team and around the city as you were getting set for that series? Well, that was huge. We had, you know, nobody had made it to the semifinals. I don't think since Daryl and the Islanders probably. No. Uh, so, and we weren't expected. So everything is just gravy. We were way past where we were supposed to go. And so it was downright just fun being a part of that. And, Anytime you're down to the final four or final two, I can only imagine what it feels like in the finals when there's only two teams left with everything yeah. that's going on. And, and LA was a team that I think everybody, much like now, we're sleeping before the West plays. So you don't realize how good those. And that was a good young hockey team. The players just coming in, uh, Rob Blake and the guys just coming into their own. So you didn't realize how good they were. And I don't think they had the travel we did. And probably one of the biggest things, we played three game sevens in the three rounds. Yeah. And that game, we should have beat St. Louis in four or five. But Curtis Joseph was, the, you know, 50 something. was awesome. Game Your buddy. He, he wouldn't let us win yeah. uh, that easily. And, and so that made us go seven games. And then we got uh, basically Wayne, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, that, there's a reason why he's the best player. You know, yeah. game, game, game seven, was he at five points and game, game six, he had four points or some, yeah. something like that. The start of that series was crazy because clearly you mentioned Probert, you mentioned Marty McSorley, and it's their job as well to turn things around. You're up big in game number one. Uh, it's over and McSorley takes a run at your buddy <laughs> and one of the most famous Leafs of all time, along with yourself, Dougie Gilmore, and he plowed him. And Dougie doesn't get up. He goes down on the ice, and you go right after McSorley and what turned out to be a legendary tilt. What do you remember of the way that kind of all unfolded when you saw what McSorley did, and you, you were going to win the game, so that was irrelevant. Walk us through what happened there. Yeah, we were, we were I know, winning 6-2 or something yeah. at the time, 5-2, 6-2, something, like, and he hit Dougie at the blue line, and all I remember is Burnsy didn't say I couldn't fight Marty. So I knew that, yeah. that after every game after that, and he's our best player. Uh, it only took me about 15 years later. I figured out I wasn't very smart. I should have just skated over the bench and one punch Gretzky. Yeah. <laughs> Marty went after our best player. Instead of me fighting that tough guy, I should have just went to their bench. Imagine the mayhem that would have caused. Could you imagine? <laughs> but, uh, and Marty was doing his job. You know, he was going, you yeah. know what? I'll wake this building up or, upset or basically his team up bit letting his team know that listen we're not done this and and that was what he was doing and i was sticking up because our best player had to feel that he could go anywhere he wanted on the ice that that's just because if your best player feels that he has that much confidence the rest of us guys that aren't as good can be a lot better when your best player can do what he wants you know it was one of my the the two pieces of video of that incident uh three pieces i guess first was the hit on dougie and not watching him he, did, he didn't get up, and Dougie always got up, so you knew it was bad. He ended up being okay. Then was the fight of the two of you going, you and McSorley going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. But I'm not sure if my favorite video wasn't watching Burns try to get at your buddy, Barry Melrose. Yeah, <laughs> no. And, and there, he's your cousin, right? Barry Melrose Barry, is your cousin? Yeah, there's another Kelvington uh, connection <laughs> there. Um, it's uh, it, it's uh, It was great because – Back in the old, like people don't see it today because of how it protected everybody is. But, you know, the gardens, there was no between the coach and the fans and the other bench. There was no barriers, no glass. The fans were sitting right beside the players. The players were stealing the kids popcorn. If you sat close enough <laughs> and true. Bernsey was going at Barry and the cameras right there in the middle as well. Our team doctors on both teams are right there. They are on those seats right in between the benches. 
And so everybody was just a part of that. And that just made that series grow so fast between the, that hit on Marty made on Dougie, then the fight and then the antics between the coaches that just up the temperature of the whole series. And there's only four teams playing. So it got very exciting. I think hockey was, or I, I mean, farming was shut down in Saskatchewan, yeah. especially the Kelvington area for the next two weeks. No kidding. And what a series it was, man. That's, that's a series that Leaf fans are still talking about. And Kings fans are obviously talking about for different reasons. You guys are up three games to two. You're one more win away from the Stanley cup final. I want to take you back. Um, in game, you have three, two. So game six. In game six, Paul Vamp makes an unbelievable. The Kings are up by a goal. It's five four. Gretzky's got a breakaway. Paul Vamp makes the unbelievable save. If he doesn't make that save, it's six four. The party's over. And then just seconds later, Paul Vamp goes to the bench for the extra attacker, and the extra attacker is you. Walk us through what happens at that moment. Yeah, I just come on the ice. I, I uh, make sure I'm uh, on and not causing the penalty with uh, Felix coming to the bench. And I'm just cruising down to the slot because Dougie is battling for the puck down below, behind the net, in the corner, in his office kind of thing. And he comes up with it. So I'm just coming through the slot. He finds me and just happened to be in that soft zone where nobody is around you and able to get the shot off as soon as he uh, got it to me. So we're all thinking, here's Wendell, drama. Paul Van, big save. Wendell scores the tying goal, and it's a hat trick goal for you. That was your third of the game to tie the game. Clearly, Wendell's going to win this at the end of regulation or in overtime. That's what's going to happen. But it all gets turned on the high stick, where Gretzky gets the high stick on Doug Gilmore. Gilmore goes down the ice. He's holding his face. Everybody, it seemed like saw the high stick. Gretzky's going to the box. You're going to have the man advantage. You're probably going to score. The game's going to get won, and you're going to the Stanley Cup final. But instead, Kerry Fraser doesn't see the high stick. The linesmen don't see the high stick. Walk us through what's going on when you guys, because I'm sure at that point you must have thought they definitely saw the high stick. We all saw the high stick. Yeah, it was. They probably didn't want the refs and the linesmen knew they wouldn't get out of the building if you're throwing Wayne Gretzky in the penalty box at that yeah. stage. But what, what, uh, probably the things that mattered most is uh, Glenn Anderson got a penalty with about 10 seconds left in the third period. We started yeah. overtime shorthanded. Had yeah. that penalty not been called, we start the game five on five in overtime. And there's a lot of, you remember back then, there was so many antics, there was no reason to call yeah. uh, that penalty. Uh, we didn't think at that time because so we, we all said we all said at that point there's there's penalties in the regular season then there's playoff penalties and you put the whistle away at that point and the there game. was no it wasn't close to the boards when it when it happened so anyways we start shorthanded so then the high stick and then nobody sees it but because you drew blood in the rule book today you're not thrown out of the game it's four minutes drawing blood and you go to the penalty box Wayne would have probably got the penalty and went to the box the rules then were if you drew blood, it's still only four minutes, but that player gets kicked out of the game. Right. You're tossed. So there's no way the ref is going to kick Wayne Gretzky yeah. in the semifinals in game six, win or lose, lost, they're gone. He's going, yeah. I can't throw him in the box. And then yeah. the ref's going to go to the linesman in that scenario. And the linesman are going, I'm not making this call. There's <laughs> no, like they're going, there's no way I'm making this call. I didn't see nothing. So you could see probably all the reactions and, and, uh, from there, we uh, we got waned. From there on in, we got waned. You got waned. Then you end up losing that game. You lose game seven, and you were that close. Now, you did come back the next year, made it to the conference final again the next year. So that was big. You had a career high 46 the next year. So did that just motivate you to to, to get back? Uh, or No, I it took me a whole year, basically. Um, when Bernsey came in, he was very hard on me as a leader because he was trying to get through to the team. It wasn't yeah. that he wanted to do it individually, but he knew if he was individually hard on me, our team was a very close group of guys and everybody rallied and stuck up for each other. So that was Burns. He kind of come in, put his stamp on everything. So it wasn't until really the end of the year where I, cause I never played with Dougie until playoffs really in 92, yeah. 93. And that's when Dougie, when I say he plays so much, he they created a third line of Dougie would play in the first line with uh, Andrew Chuck and Borchewski. Mm -hmm. And then our checking line would go out with uh, Zez, Ozzy, and Berge. And then I'd be the third scoring line with Dougie would come and play as the third line center. So he played double. Mr. Double, double shift. 
Yeah, so he so that they could create two scoring lines, and and so um, that's when I started playing with Dougie Moore. And then the stats started coming because I got all of a sudden now Doug Gilmore's your centerman. That's that's a big yeah. difference. And so in '94, um, started the season fast uh, with uh, I think John Cullen or Easty as center. Twenty, I think I had twenty goals in twenty games. And then uh, a little guy Nicky Borcheski got the spleen injury. Yeah. And then I played with Dougie full time for the rest of the year because uh, Nicky was gone. So that all of a sudden you're getting to play with that type of centerman makes a big, a big difference with your stats. In conversation with one of the great all time Leaf legends, Wendell Clark. This is the Seven Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. As well as yourself being absolutely loved in this city, um, Dougie Gilmore, a legend, a legend in the city, a legend in the game. From a guy who played with him, alongside him, was with him day to day, saw him do the kind of stuff he did for a guy who did not have a very big body and battled through an awful lot. Give us a sense, your take on Doug Gilmore as a player, as a person, as a legend in in the Toronto community. Well, what he did in that two years uh, when he came in and, and what he did for our team as and everybody rallied around that type of, uh, of player. Because under Burnsy's system, you had your offensive line and everybody else does this. That yeah. was basically it. You, if I got to play with Dougie, we could be as creative as you wanted. I, I wouldn't get in trouble. If I didn't play with Dougie, it's dump and chase and finish your check. And that, that, that there was really a mandate. And Dougie came in and just carried it. Like he could play in any situation. And that's why we kind of rallied to make sure he felt as comfortable as he possible. But Dougie was so like, that two years, I'm not saying Dougie's Wayne Gretzky because that's a pretty high mark, but that two-year window, 91, 92 to 94 there, I don't know if there was a better player in the NHL. That, that's what he did for our team, for what he did for our team uh, in that two-year window. There wasn't a better player um, in the NHL for that two-year window. It was a great window. And it, it's interesting because, um, <clears throat> I mean, so I, I've talked a lot about your, your leaf time because that's where your prime uh, part of your career was, but you got moved around a bit. You were involved in the Matt Sundin trade with the Quebec Nordique. You were involved in the Claude Lemieux tra trade with the Islanders. Uh, Roberto Luongo ended up being a first-round pick. You were involved in a trade that involved them as well. You got involved in some pretty significant trades <laughs> and did some moving around. Hey, I, kept, I, I was like a bad rash in Toronto. I kept coming home, and I kept getting traded for Hall of Famers. <laughs> what, what's wrong with this scenario? <laughs> what was that like for you to get dealt like that? Because – like I, I get the sense from, from knowing you over the years, you're a, you're a guy who's like, you like what you like and you're happy with this. I don't need to be anywhere else. What was that like getting moved around like that? Um, well, you know, once you, once the first trade happens, then it's a job. Then you realize that's probably what hockey became a job for me yeah. was right up till then you leave high school, you play junior into the NHL for the first nine years. You're, you, you know, hiccups type thing. You, that's just life. And then you start getting trade. Now you understand the job part of the game and trades and the business end of the game. And, and, and so then, then you get a, 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 a shell, uh, a tough skin because now it doesn't matter where you play. You're just, you're, you're just part of uh, the business of the game. Now you, you, you really, I think, wake up and learn the business end once you start getting moved and it's uh, you don't have as much emotion, I think, tied to everything where there's always lots of emotion when you get drafted to that team and you spend a good start there there's a huge emotion but after that it's all about the job and the business end then once you start getting traded which is true but i know you well enough that at the base of it all you're a kid you're a kid who loved the game you love the joys of the game um and sometimes you get distracted by people who are in the crowd when you're a kid, like you are sometimes with celebrities in Los Angeles. Do you want to tell the story about how sometimes uh, a young guy lets his mind wander when there's a celebrity in the crowd, like, I don't know, Mary Hart? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I've got somebody, I can't remember was Krusalinski or somebody went down. It was in the, it had to be in the 90s, I think, in the 91. And and you're playing in the old forum. So all the celebrities always sat front row, which they're always the worst seats on the side boards, but they were all yeah. sitting in the penalty box. And that's where, our guy was down the trainer come out and they're going off the ice because he was fine. And the, all us guys in the circle and no, no, stay down. We're going to stay down. The trainer's looking at us. Oh no, we're just trying to find there's Mary Hart sitting right there. There's Sylvester <laughs> Stallone sitting right there. So 
the people on TV watching the game on Saturday night back in Toronto are thinking how serious this is. Meanwhile, us in the huddle are <laughs> seeing who's sitting next to the glass because you didn't sit low. You sit, the, the glass seats in LA were right, right uh, feet height uh, on top of the glass. So you, so we were there having fun <laughs> in, in the middle of the game when you think you should be dead serious. That's hilarious. Uh, listen, you got to play in the heydays of Maple Leaf Gardens, the old barn there, those tiny rickety aluminum seats for the fans that they were in there. Uh, you even, Did you ever get a chance to be in the visitor's room in, in Maple Leaf Gardens? One game, yeah, one game, came back with the Islanders. Came back. Was that the not the worst, wor worst dressing that room, not just in the being, NHL, but yeah. across all of hockey? All of hockey, that visiting room, because well, I was fine because I was 5'10", but if you're a Matt Sundin, 6'3", you couldn't stand straight up in the dressing room. And the dressing room was about 120 degrees at the end of a game because there's no air conditioning. And it was tiny. Still, low roof. The only thing that really compared where the dressing rooms were that bad were uh, the, uh, the old odd in Buffalo where we had two wee little rooms. Mm -hmm. And in St. Louis, uh, I think maybe that was the odd. In St. Louis, the little igloo there, you, you had two dressing rooms. The defense sat in one and the forward <laughs> sat in the other one. Um, but this no, is the National the, Hockey League. Yeah, the National Hockey League right there. It, well, that's where, where there was definite home and road ranks back then. Yeah. And, and it meant something more in the playoffs because those situations as what your dressing room was, what the rink was shaped like, every rink was built different. Where today, everybody's got a good dressing room. Every rink is built to spec identical. So the, the home and road doesn't mean as much today as it did back then. Like the Boston Bruins were built for that garden. You know, so your Montreal Canadiens in the forum, you know, even the Leafs in Chicago Stadium, they were all teams were built around the type of building you had. Yeah. Yeah. I remember um, a lot of great moments and, and one of my favorite moments with you involved uh, number 17 going up to the rafters when the Toronto Maple Leafs recognize you that way. What are your reflections back on how did you hear that that was going to happen? And what was it like the actual night of? Um, I, I, don't, I probably at the start of the year, or a couple of weeks before it happened, I was uh, given the heads up that, that the honor that was going to be bestowed. And that's, that's probably the biggest honor you're up there. And there's Johnny Bauer and Daryl Sittler and, all the guys, Borea saw me. That's that's you're you're now in the rafters forever. So that's that's uh, a huge huge honor, and it was kind of a, a, a pinnacle of of getting drafted to the Leafs, getting to wear the C for the Leafs, and then up in the rafters. That's that that's a pinnacle of getting to play in uh, in Toronto. And now you represent the Leafs organization as an ambassador, a community ambassador. So you get to kind of relive and share some stories. When you look back on that, how much how much do you enjoy still being able to do that, still being able to tell the stories and, and share the great moments that you had as a Leaf? Right, well, I think it's fun that you're because every time you're you're in the building and you're talking the game uh, with fans, and it's the fans that really love the game. And the greatest thing uh, about our game is you you've got the kids to the parents to the grandparents. And so when I first started doing the job, it was myself the kids kind of still knew me. Then you had Daryl with the dads and you had Johnny Bauer with the grandparents. It was, it's unbelievable how it hits all through the generations. And now I'm getting to be that old guy. And I have to point to the little guy at the box with his dad that, yeah, that, that's I, I'm in the rafters there. He doesn't, he doesn't know. Right. But it's, it's, uh, it's always fun because it's about hockey and winning and having fun and the blue and white and uh, the fans love it. Wendell, this has been great. I appreciate you taking the time. I love bumping into you on the golf courses and, and out and about and, and seeing you and the way you're still idolized in this market in the Toronto market's amazing. Thanks so much for sharing all these stories. It's been so much fun reminiscing with you, my friend. All good. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Toronto Bay Police legend Wendell Clark. The Overtime Podcast is proudly presented by 7-Eleven. Before leaving the rink, order your favorite Slurpee, fresh 100% premium Arabica coffee. Toronto Maple Leaf hockey legend, Wendell Clark. The Overtime Podcast is proudly presented by 7-Eleven. 
Before leaving the rink, order your favorite Slurpee. Fresh, 100% premium Arabica coffee, hot from the oven pizza and wings, pint of ice cream, or even a carton of milk, eggs, loaf of bread from the 7 Now app and Team 7-Eleven will have your order ready for pickup 24-7. Hey, if you missed any parts of the show, don't worry. Visit our website at overtimepodcast.ca where you can both listen to and subscribe to future shows. 7-Eleven's Overtime Podcast can be found on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, iTunes Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. Until next week, I'm Gino Reddit saying so long, hockey fans, and thanks for joining us on the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast.